Today's guest is juggling this podcast in between covering matches at the BMP Paribas Open in Indian Wells. He's a former top ATP player, a college tennis player, tournament director of Miami Open, broadcast media analysis, author, father, husband, Dunlop ambassador, and so much more. Welcome to the Talk Tennis Podcast, James Blake. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah. And I don't know about the so much more you got. You, I think you covered it all. <laughs> well, there's a few more things that I just learned about you that I'm going to ask you about uh-huh. towards the end. All right. Um, well, I could get into it right now. I just got done with a quick run, but did I see that you're training for a marathon? No, no, no. I oh, trained okay. for one. I did. I did one. Uh, <laughs> and I planned on it being one and done. That was it. I did New York City Marathon in 2015 for my foundation. Uh, the James Blake Foundation. We raise a lot of money and I have runners run it every year pretty much um, uh, where they raise money and we get them into it and I'm happy to support them, but I will not be running another one. I don't think that 26 miles did a, did a number on my body. It was, I was sore for quite a while after that. Yeah. Us tennis players, like more than three miles. Mm, no, we're good. <laughs> yeah, three to four miles is my, uh, is about my sweet spot any more than that. And I'm not, not thrilled about it. I hear you. Well, I wanted to kind of start with some gear chat. We like to kind of separate ourselves from other tennis podcasts by talking about gear specifically. And you are a partner, an ambassador for Dunlop, and you use Dunlop for a long part of your career. So can you talk to me about your relationship with Dunlop and when that began? Yeah, I remember the exact time because I loved uh, uh, Dunlop. It was the 1999 Hopman Cup when I was testing racks, I just turned pro in the summer of, of 99, left college and I was testing out rackets, seeing what I was going to like, what I was going to use, if I was going to switch to anything or, or stick with, I had been using Wilson in, uh, in college and I tried a few, uh, Dunlops and then I, I grabbed one of them. It was the, um, the 200 G, mm-hmm. um, when I was playing the Hopman cup and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to try it. I was playing Wayne Ferreira at the time who was, I believe top 10 in the world. And I went out and played unbelievable. And as soon as I picked up the racket and tried it, I basically called my agent that day and said, I'm switching. There's no, there's, I I don't ever want to look at these other rackets again. I want to use this, uh, this Dunlop racket, send as many as you can. I only had like two at the time. I think that I want to send me as many as they can send me. And I want, I want to use these. So I, I switched to it then and almost my entire career, I was with Dunlop as well and felt great. Uh, just felt so comfortable with them. And then, Luckily, after my career, they wanted me to be a, a continue being part of the company and an ambassador because I had been so vocal about how great the rackets were for my entire career. And I feel like they were so, I don't know, they were just perfect for me. I feel like it, it's such an individual decision that you have to, on tour, you also tailor them to, you, you tailor the weight perfectly, you tailor the string, you tailor the um, the balance and everything. So uh, for me, the the Dunlops were just perfect. So I'm, I'm happy to still be uh, affiliated with them and now using the, the CX200, which has changed a bit from, you know, the technology keeps getting better and better, but um, I still still remember and have very fond memories of that 200G. Nice. And can you mention some things that maybe set it apart from other brands that you've tried or even rackets you've tried recently that aren't Dunlop? Because I feel like there's a certain craftsmanship to the Dunlop brand that's really hard to explain until you kind of get it in your hands, but maybe you can put it into better words than I can. Yeah. So for Dunlop, like I said, it was, it was just instant. And when I, when I tried it, it felt that that 200G felt a little different. I think a lot of it had to do with the material they were using. Um, it was material that eventually was, um, not used in, in tennis rackets anymore that has changed. And Mm -hmm. now, um, in the newer Dunlop ones, they don't use the same material, but they've found a way to give that same feel for me. It's, it's more of just like a solid feeling. I think a lot of today's rackets to me, when, if I were to try them, um, feel kind of hollow and they're extremely light. Um, which is great for most players. It's great for people just picking up the sport to to have a, a feeling of still being able to go go through the ball and get a lot of power. With the Dunlops, I feel like in mine, I liked the feeling of being able to feel the ball on the strings and being able to feel the power that I'm creating. And Dunlop always gave me that feel. Um, I think there's still a few rackets that a lot of people probably consider them sort of like old school type of rackets, which is sad that I am old and using these kind of old school rackets. But um, the, the CX200 now um, gives me that feel, but it still has the newer technology with a lot more power, which I need more of now. Um, back when I was on tour, I was creating so much more of it on my own. And I, and I remember thinking when I was using the, the 200G and the way I was customizing them and how heavy they were and how tight I was stringing the racket, they would never have been perfect for 
your everyday average weekend player um, because it was it was just too heavy. It was too tough for for a lot of people to create the power. But if you take all that strip off all that lead tape that I had on it, you, you string the racket a lot looser. They still had that great feel of, of being really solid. Um, so I just I don't know if I did it did it justice for how good the Dunlop brackets do feel. But the way they're um, coming through with the technology and it's getting better and better. I, I I'm proud to be a part of the company. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned something that I think is important too, is that there are rackets even in the CX line for players of every level. And then even if you demand something more, customizing is such a great way to make it completely yours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people used to, when I was still on tour, they'd grab my rack and be like, oh, do you mind if I try and hit some with it? I'd be like, yeah, you, you can go ahead and hit all try. you want. You're going to hurt your elbow. You're going to hurt your shoulder. I mean, I was using a, a racket that was, uh, it was over 370 grams. Wow. Um, uh, when it was strong, uh, I think it was closer to 380. So it was, and I would say a normal racket for most people when they pull it off the shelf is about 310, 320 grams. And so you're talking about 60 extra grams. You're swinging every single shot. It, it's just, it, it was just too much unless you get used to it. And I, even I had to build up to that very slowly. I would add, when I started on tour, I would add two or three grams. I'd use that for three weeks. I'd add two or three grams. I'd use that for two or three weeks until I got to where I felt comfortable with it. And it was good for my shoulder and arm. Yeah. And you hinted at it. And I know you used to string very high in the sixties and yeah. um, I kind of grew up around the same time as you. I'm a little bit younger, but I also like, we didn't grow up with polyester strings first yeah. of all. Um, yeah. But how has your stringing preferences changed from when you were a pro to now? Sadly, they haven't changed. Yes, I, I, I love I, hearing that. I, I tried. I really, really tried so hard. <laughs> Even when I was on tour, because people kept uh, sort of um, goading me to say, you know what, yeah. Yeah, play, you need to, you need to drop it down. It's gotta be. And I tried, I tried so hard. And a lot of people called me stubborn, but I, they weren't behind the scenes and the practices saying where well, I tried it. And I just, I was awful. I really just was not very good when I would string it in the fifties and stuff. And I, I was stringing at that time, once polyester came in and I was using the polyester string, I was stringing at 68 with an 1820 string pattern. Um, so it was a board, it was yeah. an absolute board. And, um, I would try to drop it down and I just, I couldn't control it. And then when I retired and I started playing in some of these champions events and stuff, I tried really hard again. Cause I'm like, you know what? I'm not on tour anymore. I don't need to do this. Let's try down at 54, 56, 58. And I just couldn't keep, um, and I was wondering like, oh, maybe it's just cause I'm not practicing, but no, I couldn't keep a ball on the court. Let me try going back up a little bit. And so I, I went back up, I went back up and it just felt better and better. And now I'm back up at around 65, 66 yes. uh, with a polyester string. Now I use this laser fiber string, um, but it's, um, it's similar. It's a polyester string and it, it feels great uh, up at those high attentions. <laughs> Yeah. I love that. Every time I hear you talk about your string, it like reminds me that like, it's okay if that's what you like string up and it doesn't hurt your arms. <laughs> yeah. And I heard so many people saying it was going to kill my elbow and it's yeah. gonna be much. And you know, Pete strung it really tight. Philip used to string it really tight. Both of them had pretty good serves. Their shoulders ended up being okay. So I figured I, I, I can still probably do it. It's just, if it, if it works for you, it works. And now I see guys now nowadays stringing in the low forties, even at once in a while in the thirties. And I just don't know how they keep, keep the ball in, in the court, but um, it's just the, the, the way the game has been going. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Dunlop, let me know that you've also been play testing a little bit. Um, they mentioned a couple of the CX lines of rackets, the CX 200, CX 200 tour. And they said there was a CX 200 limited 18 by 20 that you're testing. Can you give me any insight to that? Well, I'm trying to, so I used 1820 throughout, uh, pretty much my whole career. And so I like that. I just like to feel, um, I switched from that. I think pretty much right when I came out of college, I think I, I had tried one, one other pros racket and I, and they were 1820 and I was 16, 18 at that point. Or, and it just felt good. It just felt again, like it, it gripped the ball a little bit better. I, I think with the uh, looser string pattern, you're going to get more spin. And I wasn't a player that played with tons of spin. I wasn't hitting huge kick serves. I wasn't, my forehand wasn't jumping off the court. Mine was more going through the court. And I felt like the 1820 pattern was a little more solid for that. So that CX tour limited for me, I, like they said, I'm testing them right now. Like I, I literally have them strung up and, and in my car. And as soon as I get home, I'm going to, I'm going to try those out. Nice. Um, and I have a feeling that 1820 is going to feel a little better for me where I can hit through the court a little bit more. Not that I hit through the court quite like I used to hit through the court, but the the little bit I can, that's going to help me a little bit perform the way I want to perform. But I understand a lot of people that, that love the 1618 for giving them that little extra jump on their kick serve and that jump on their, if, if they've got real heavy strokes, it's going to, it's going to jump that up a little more. 
And how much feedback does Dunlop take from you? Are they looking for your input on updating this line or they just want to see how it plays in your hands? Are you working pretty closely with them? Yeah, that's up to them. How much they want to to <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't tell them how much or how little to listen to me, but they, um, you know, they, amazingly they do actually take, um, take what I have to say to heart as opposed to, you know, sometimes, and a lot of times I will qualify it as saying, look, I, this is the way I feel, but I understand I'm, I'm maybe not your everyday average player. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've, I've been playing the sport for my whole life and I've been playing, um, hopefully for most of my life at a pretty high level, as opposed to, um, a lot of the consumers want to go out there once a week and play tennis and enjoy it and, and have a racket that, that performs for them. So I kind of give them my input. And a lot of times I think they use that much more for their real, real high end or high level rackets that are, that are more for the college level players, the pro players, um, as opposed to the ones that are for your three Oh three, five type players. Yeah, for sure. And have you ever had a chance to go to their headquarters and see how it all, where the magic happens? Um, so I mean, I actually went to, um, their golf headquarters because nice. I, I do like play golf now, but I have not been to the, uh, to the tennis ones yet. So, um, I'll have to check that out at some point, but I saw where they, uh, where they make the tricks on, uh, golf clubs. Uh, yes. and that's pretty cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're going to do a little bit of a pivot and you now are the director tournament director at Miami. First of all, I feel like there needs to be like a side tournament for all of the former pros that are tournament directors. Cause it's like you, Tommy, Feliciano, Ferrer, Ferrero, like you guys could just do a whole come together and play like a little, but uh, some yeah, sort I, of tournament. Do, I don't think I would do very well in that, uh, in that <laughs> event. I need, I need Todd Martin in there and Richard Krychek and some of the older guys to, to get in there too, for me to have a chance to win a couple of rounds. Oh, that'd be so awesome. But something that we've seen kind of, um, come to a head over COVID is the importance of tennis balls. And I know mm -hmm. this is such a silly question. Maybe you've never even been asked about the balls that you guys use at Miami, but talk to me about the balls that are used on ATP and WTA at the Miami open. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people, um, may not realize that there's, uh, there's different balls <laughs> that are, are used, uh, on tour for the men and the women, but, yeah. um, for the men, we use the ATP extra duty ones for the, um, for the women, we use the grand Prix regular. So there's just, it's just a difference in the fuzz, um, uh, and the, the weight of the balls. Um, they do that a lot of the grand slams, but in general, the Dunlop balls have been approved by the players and, and the players have been extremely happy about them in, in so many events. They use the Australian Open and we use very similar balls to the Australian Open and um, it seems to work out well. The players, you know, the, the times when you're hearing about the ball is usually not a good thing uh, when you're dealing with players because they're, they're not coming to tell you, oh, everything's great. They're usually coming to tell you that they're terrible or they really don't like them or they're fuzzing up way too fast or they're um, too many of them are breaking or whatever, but um, you just don't hear complaints about the Dunlop balls. They're absolutely solid. Yeah, for sure. And um, we've kind of made a big push on trying to educate tennis players that you can really like make your experience really nice and premium when you are picking a ball that bounces consistently and is durable instead of just kind of like, oh, that one's cheap, but how's your experience going to be? So it really does matter what ball you're playing with, which is. Yeah, I think for for um, for people, they they need to realize that they aren't playing in pro events that, you know, it is they're, they're changing them all the time. But, you know, you, you've got the consistency and you've got the the durability. And with, with Dunlop, the, the durability is, is really key because uh, you can go out and play for hours and hours with those Dunlop balls and you're not going to get a drop in performance. You're not going to get them that are just, they're, they're pretty much done after an hour or something as some of the other balls might be. Exactly. And then this is the first time probably for you since you've taken over as tournament director that like you're at BMP and you don't have to like run over to Miami right away. <laughs> this is really the first chance I, first and maybe the only chance I'll get to actually be here because yeah, normally I don't get to be here because I am getting to Miami early and I'm, I'm there and I'm on the, I'm on the grounds there while this BMP Paribas event is going on. So um, for me, the fact that um, it's in October and I get to, I get to be here, it's a, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll take the silver lining of it being postponed from earlier this year of the fact that I get to be here. It's a, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, it's always been one of my favorite events to be at. So I'm, I'm happy to happy to be here again. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit more about your foundation, the James Blake Foundation? Absolutely. So it started in um, 2005. Uh, my father passed away in 2004. And um, uh, we wanted to do I, I wanted to do a one time event uh, to memorialize him. 
and I ended up, uh, it turned into a foundation that has grown since then. I wanted to do a one-time event with, with friends, especially people that knew my dad. And, um, that was going to be, I was going to play Andy Roddick in tennis. And, um, I grew up with John Mayer and he knew my parents very well. And so I asked him to, uh, to be a part of it as well. And he performed and Gavin DeGraw as well did. So, uh, once I did that and I saw the response that I got from people and even Andre Agassi took note and said he would do it the next year. And so I talked to my agent, I said, Andre kind of, if Andre already agreed to do it next year, I don't think we can stop doing this. So, um, we did it every year that I was on tour from then after, um, I think I had one year off where I got married, had a kid and moved. Uh, so all in, all in one, uh, one year. So I kind of, I was a little busy that year, but, um, other than that, we did it every year. And since then now we've, we've shifted our focus from doing one big event every year to doing a lot of little things. Um, we do usually a dinner out in San Diego. We do some poker events. We've done a virtual poker event during COVID. Uh, and one of our biggest things is the New York City Marathon where we have, it started with four runners um, the first year we did it, um, raising $3,000 each. And now we're up to last, the last time it was on, I think we had 34 runners for our foundation running. Um, and it all goes to cancer research, um, early detection of cancer research at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, so we've raised and donated over a million dollars um, to Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I uh, just want to give everyone a chance, the opportunity to, to um, get have early detection and have that treatment get better and better. That's amazing. I love that. Um, next generation of tennis. What are you seeing out there? Who are your favorites on the men's and women's side? Who should we take note of? Tell me, tell me with all your expert knowledge and you're watching all these matches, who should we keep an eye on? Uh, well, on the men's side, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting situation right now is this, the, the sort of next gen guys, the really young guys, I think have actually pushed, um, these guys that are still on the very young side, but have been out here on tour, like the Taylor Fritz, the Riley Opelkas, uh, Francis Tiafos, Tommy Pauls, you know, they've been out here for a few years and they've been hearing, you know, okay, one of them is going to be the next one. Who's going to step up? Who's going to step up? And to this point, none of them have really broken out. Uh, Riley Opelka has had a great year this year, making the finals of a master series. But now to hear about Sebastian Corda, Brandon Nakashima, and these even younger guys, mm-hmm. um, I think that's actually pushing them a little bit more. And they're excited to show that they're still around and they still have plenty of years of success ahead of them. But if I, if I had to pick one out of the whole group, I would possibly say um, Sebastian Corda has uh, possibly the biggest upside. Uh, I love his game. I love the way he moves. I love it, how easy he creates power. So I, I think he's got a great upside. He's got the pedigree. Obviously, both his sisters are unbelievable athletes uh, in the world of the LPGA. His dad and mom were both excellent tennis players. So um, I think he's got a lot going for him. He, he's, his mind seems right. He works well with Dean Goldfein. Um, on the women's side, I mean, Coco Golf is still 17. I mean, we talk about yeah. uh, Raducanu and Leila Fernandez and the, them being so young and so good at 18 and 19 years old, and she's still 17 um, and top 20 in the world. And there are definitely some things that a lot of people feel she can improve and work on her forehand possibly or serve. Um, and I think people need to you know, just realize that there is time for her to do that. She is only 17. So I think in year, in the years to come, she's going to have tons of success and she's going to fix up, a, a, fix a few things that, that maybe are lacking. But if, if all of us were honest that how good our games were at 17 years old and how good hers is, we, you know, we would kill to have the game that she has at 17, um, knowing that the potential is still there for it to continue to improve. Yeah. And she was a finalist in doubles at the U S open. Like yeah. she's all around. She's got it. She's awesome. Definitely. Definitely. Cool. That's good to hear. Um, you're also a father. I think you have two little girls, girls right? Little girls. Yeah. yeah. Are they playing tennis at all? I know that's a silly question. They, they play a little bit. They play a little bit of everything, which I love oh, right good. now. They're nine and seven years old. So they play soccer. They play tennis a little bit. They play flag football. Flag football might be their favorite right now, which yes. I wish was around when I was a kid. And my older daughter, the, the nine-year-old, is on an all-girls team, and they absolutely get a kick out of beating up on a bunch of boys' teams. I mean, I'm a proud dad, so I'm going to admit that they're undefeated so far this season, and yes. they've beaten up on a few of these boys' teams, and they absolutely love it. And it's so fun to watch them come together and have fun and run these plays and play defense, and they're they have a good time. So I I love that my kids do a little bit of everything, and my little daughter has her. Uh, She's the lead in her place, Cruella DeVille, this weekend uh, in, in 101 Dalmatians. So they do a little bit of everything. And that's what I, I like about this age is they can do everything. And in the next three, four, five years is when they'll figure out what they really want to focus on and what they care about, what they're either the best at or what they like the most. And then I would encourage them to really put time and energy into that. But for right now, 
at nine and seven, I want them to have fun and be social mm-hmm. and do what and figure out what they love. That's awesome. Such good. That's so good to hear. And such a good girl, dad. I love it. That's oh, awesome. The best. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know any other way. I, I mean, I think every, every boy growing up, you assume you'll have a, a boy to throw the ball around with and whatever. And you, you assume that, but I, I, I honestly wouldn't know what to do uh, with a boy. <laughs> right now because i've got my two girls in there uh my wife says i deserve them because they needed to soften me up and uh oh. she says they have. <laughs> that's cute okay i have one more question and this might be the most controversial question Uh-oh. um but i have to bring it up um Uh-oh. the major league of pickleball yeah ah, so yeah. you know you you're in it um and you're yep. in tennis you know that yep. that word can be a little divisive Absolutely. talk to, talk to me a little bit about it so, yeah, I, I've talked to tons of tennis players that can't stand pickleball. Tons of tennis <laughs> players have gotten into it and really like it. And you're right. It is extremely divisive. For me, the way I look at it is it's a racket sport that is very easy to get in on the ground as sort of the, the base level of it. So if you're just going out and you can pick up a pickleball paddle and a racket and a ball and you can just hit, like I said, I have a nine and a seven year old. I can put up a little net in my uh, driveway and just hit back and forth with them. And it's not to say that it's totally easy, but it's so much easier than hitting tennis balls at a, at a very young age. So just getting them involved in that and having them do that and then transitioning them to tennis or if they like tennis better or if they can, it can help them with the hand eye to get closer to tennis, then that's great. My mom is 86 years old. She played tennis most of her life and the tennis is tough around her knees now. She's got two new knees and uh, pickleball is a little easier. So for her to play at her senior center pickleball, keeps her active. You know what? That's a, that's a positive. That's a win for me is that she's still using her tennis skills, being active, playing pickleball. And then everyone in between that is being social with it. I I don't see the downside of like, Oh, it's taking away from tennis. You know what? If you love tennis, I hope you keep going out and playing tennis. I don't think you're going to be enamored and fall in love with pickleball and want to want to take that over instead dead of tennis. But if you're going to get into a, a racket sport that you were never going to get into tennis and now you're going to get into pickleball, so be it. Maybe that'll uh, that'll show you and get you some skills that the next time you do socially with friends here about going to play tennis, maybe it'll make you a little bit more skilled, maybe a little make you a little better and more likely to, to play that. So I look at it as a positive. It's growing so much. I mean, that then the other thing is that you, you can't really fight something that is already so established and becoming and growing so fast. So you might as well kind of go with the, go with the time that that, um, people are loving it. And, you know, I, I play when I get the chance and it doesn't take away from the fact that I play tennis when I get the chance too. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It really helps my footwork and my hands at the net in doubles. So yeah. And it's fun. (laughs) And having all the tennis skills, it it, it has definitely been fun as I've been learning it since like the first few times I played the people I was playing with, wouldn't let me play uh, righty. They said I had to play left. (laughs) That's it was unfair. And um, as I'm learning and as I'm getting better, the, the footwork is is what's so fun. And people have noticed when I play with people that just play once in a while and um, how easy for me the transition is from tennis footwork to pickleball footwork because it is so similar and that you're always moving your feet. You're still getting in the right position. You're doing all these adjustment steps. And so that makes it that makes a huge difference. And I love it. Awesome. Well, that was positive and I love hearing that. And hopefully our audience does as well. James, thank you so much for taking the time and your busy schedule. I really appreciate it. And it was a delight talking to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Thanks. Take care.